and in this house, the most dire, horrible events took place. Hello chat, how are you doing this evening? We are here on a slightly unusual stream. We have gone rogue, kind of, kind of. This is all fitting into um, a 90s sci-fi horror arc that I've been doing. And the 90s is an incredibly, <laughs> oh, we're, we're kind of overloaded for sci-fi horror in the 90s. I guess that it's that early CGI, it's that um, cheaper effects. It's that slightly better green screen. Everyone wanted to do sci-fi horror. And it was a really choice what should go in the mix. And, you know, I was thinking dark city or species. And I I just couldn't do it. Dark city had to go in. We had to class this joint up. And uh, to keep it classy, I'm joined by uh, two returning guests who have been on the uh, slightly rogue streams. The last one we did was uh, Saint Maud a while ago. Welcome back, uh, Aaron McIntyre. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Absolute pleasure. I hope you're doing well. And uh, last things as well, returning guest and a friend of the channel. It's great to be back. Always a pleasure having you. And um, can I, I want to check my memory. Was this a first watch for you, LT? No, uh, and well, uh, so it's probably been over a, a, a decade since I saw Dark City, um, and I watched it actually. Li I li literally watched it last night just before bed to uh, kind of have it fresh in, in my mind. But it had been, um, yeah, it had been at least ten years since I I saw it. Yeah, that is very similar to how it is for me. Um, how about yourself, Aaron? Uh, I want to say I watched this probably. 15 years ago and then yeah i i really love the movie so i've seen it a number of times and uh and i introduced my wife to it last year uh because she had never seen it and i knew that it would be right up her alley so I, i'm i'm a big fan of this movie i've seen it many many times oh fantastic uh, did did she take to it as well yeah she absolutely loved it she's a she's a big fan of noir and and uh you know sci-fi and just you know the merger of the two is is perfect so Oh, definitely. I mean, the noir elements are absolutely in there. This and this is this has been so exciting for me. I've been going into a lot of the '40s and '50s stuff, um, singing the praises of a lovely little film called Double Indemnity, a lot, a lot from uh, I think it's 1951 or 1941, and just the outfits in this are so reminiscent of it. I absolutely love it. There's kind of a fun thing in the design of this film is that it's. It leans towards sort of 40s and 50s noir, but it has these sort of hodgepodges from all different time periods. And it's it's a really nice touch in the design of the film. Yeah, I really love the aesthetics of the film. I can, can get lost in half the movie for me is just the visual uh, in this one. I think that uh, I, I definitely see what you're, you're, you're saying, Chloe, with the uh um the noir and the the 40s and 50s vibe i got a lot of real um kind of 90s gothic punk uh aesthetic mm. out of it as well oh yes yes um i i hadn't connected it together but uh it did not surprise me at all to know that this is from the director of the crow which i now really want to rewatch. i i didn't know that but that made makes absolute sense now mm. that you said it <laughs> mm. 
yeah yeah and uh yeah kudos just kudos to the design i was noticing such creative shots that frame things so well it's just visually it's a feast um what i try and do i how can i say i i, I don't like to punish you guys when when, when i offer a film to you I, I don't like to throw too much schlock your way so i, I was quite selective when i went when i uh, suggested saint maud and i figured dark city is a good one to offer to to you two is there is a heck of a lot going under the surface um i mean if, if you're ever interested in watching some trash i i can more than accommodate <laughs> but i I, th I think we work up to that um and because there's so much to say about this film, um, I figured we we had to do it. It couldn't be missed. Um, one of the things, <laughs> one of the things that I found really interesting, and I should probably say at this point um, before we get into it, we are going to spoil the heck out of this movie. Uh, if you haven't seen Dark City, you know, don't don't spoil yourself. It's fine. Uh, watch it, enjoy it fully, and then watch the stream another time. I don't want you to be spoiled. This apparently was not a concern for the studios, who, after test audiences, found the plot a little confusing, uh, decided that they would just put an opening narration that gave away the main premise of the movie straight away in the first minute and 38 seconds. Scandalous. Yeah, we were talking about how it really had that strong Blade Runner vibe of just like, oh, no, there's no way these people can possibly understand the movie. Let's just completely destroy any nuance by just blurting everything out and info dumping it in the first, you know, two minutes. I know. I know. Oh, I'm surprised there's no there's there, Chloe. Is there any director's cut um, lurking about somewhere where they just snip that that narration out of the first couple minutes of the film? There is indeed. Uh, I watched it for the first time yesterday. I'd, I'd only seen the theatrical before, um, but the directors, the it feels cheating to say, well, the first thing they do is get rid of the opening narration because obviously it's an opening narration. It's the first thing you can change. Um, but yeah, they took that out um, and it's, it's otherwise not too different. Um, I would probably need to do a closer comparison but it mostly just moves at a gentler pace. Scenes are a little bit longer, a few more bits of dialogue to develop things. So it's not too different a vision, um, but just getting rid of that opening narration is, is one of the main things that they fixed. So very welcome. And I think it's about 14 minutes longer. Um, but I, I think as long as you, you skipped the spoiler intro, you'd probably be fine for it. Um, so as I said, we're, we're going to spoil the heck out of this movie because um, there's there's no way we can really get into it if we don't. So if you don't want to be spoiled, this is your chance to bounce out. We're also going to, I hope, uh, discuss it with particular focus on the uh, recent book, The Populist Delusion, because very interestingly, I think Dark City has a lot to say with regards to... Uh, what, you, what would you say, elite theory, um, which we'll get into. Um, Enriab, uh, note, note that the director's cut cuts it out. I watched it last night. You're safe. If you watch the directors, you're fine. No spoiling. But um, yes, I suppose we, we should probably do a quick summary. Um, would either of you like to do a sort of um, elevator summary of what Dark City is about? Just a quick plot overview. Uh, sure. Uh, basically, it's, you know, this uh, guy wakes up in a hotel room. Uh, there is a uh, hooker dead on in, in on the floor. So, you know, we're strong, starting strong with the noir stuff. And uh, she, she's well carved up and he's not sure, who, you know, who he is or what is going on. We've all been yeah. there. Yeah, uh, well, try, you try not to fed post on your stream, but yeah, no. Um, <laughs> um but you know, for those of us who haven't experienced this directly, last things, uh, yeah, no, he's gets a strange call, uh, saying, you know, I know you're in this situation, they're after you, you need to leave. 
And uh, as he flees the scene, you know, you know, he's he doesn't know where he is. He's going through these different confusing uh, experiences. He ends up being chased by these uh, kind of uh, ghoulish white uh, people in trench coats with with uh, hats. And uh, as he ends up uh, fleeing from them, he finds out that he can kind of fight them with this power uh, that he has. Uh, it slowly uh, through the revelation of meeting the other person on the end of the phone, who's a doctor, he finds out that these people are basically visitors who have control of the city he's in. They're manufacturing the lives of the people around him and controlling uh, the kind of the scene of the world around him. They're injecting these people with different memories and so uh, these people are living different lives. They're being put to sleep in the middle of the night and then rearranged, given new lives so that these strangers can kind of uh, experiment on, on them and, and find out kind of what humanity is and what it's about. I, I believe the, the line is that they're looking for the human soul in particular to better understand it. And uh, as, as it kind of goes through these different revelations, the man realizes that uh, he can't, you know, none of the characters can remember who they are or their past if they think back too far, because, of course, the memories have been given to them. And he realizes that even his childhood, where he grew up in this fictional area of the city, uh, Shell Beach, uh, is, is not real. The beach doesn't exist. Uh, eventually, through a number of different kind of kind of action scenes, he gets out to Shell Beach, only to discover that the world, the city itself, is actually on a spaceship, and they're all trapped on a spaceship with this alien race that's been using these captured humans as uh, you know as as test subjects to kind of figure out how to carry on the race because they can't. They've kind of e- reached the end of their evolutionary. Uh, cycle and they they can't figure out how to continue forward or reproduce and they're kind of human using humans for this and so he has to fight back against these aliens and uh, take control of the the mechanisms using the powers that he has that are the same as theirs to reshape reality and eventually he ends up defeating them in a very anime style uh, fight up, up in the uh, sky and then, uh, and then, re- kind of reshapes the world back uh, to the way he wants it uh, at the end. There, absolutely oh. nailed it. <laughs> I was hoping I hit the plot points. I was like, ah, okay, yeah, yeah. And uh, the anime psychic battle is true. I mean, I, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. they, I think by this point they know that a psychic battle is really hard to make look good on screen. Yeah. You know, otherwise it's just like it can look so much like uh, that meme of the kid in class with the veins popping on his forehead. <laughs> And just two of those guys going at it, you know. Um, I thought that uh, Cronenberg kind of nailed it in Scanners. Oh, that's yeah. That's really the exception that proves the rule, probably. Yeah, and I think he knew how to... He, from my memory of Scanners, Cronenberg took a really different approach to Proyas. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. I think he kept a, a relatively static frame, but he had lots of physical stuff going on uh, on the on the humans. And they were a lot more animated. Whereas yeah. I noticed in this, they they basically did reach their power anime poses. Mm-hmm. And while they're going super scion, the camera's just doing all the work, just like cutting all around and throwing CGI in. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. T- yeah. Two different approaches, but they definitely worked because you, you just can't hold on the two guys death staring each other for too long or it looks a bit silly. But they worked around it pretty well. Um. Yeah, so that is our basic setup for Dark City. Uh, Your protagonist in a kind of noir-like environment, a very sort of dark, moody city, finds himself realizing that actually his entire world around him is a bit of an illusion and uh, a very different uh, elite basically controls everything, making his reality an illusion. And he has to break free of that illusion. It's a, oh, I don't know. It's got the old noggin jogging. That that kind of reminds me of something. Um, hmm. Oh, yeah. I thought a really fun thing to do would be to sort of, and I'm trying not to make this a theme, but it does keep happening. Um, how this film is a better Matrix than The Matrix. Or at oh, least yeah. just compare them. Well, yeah, 100%. <laughs> yeah. Um, a major thing. And by the way, the plot summary is 
one element of this, but I don't know if you knew this, but it was the Matrix was shot literally about a year later on the exact same location, same studio, some of the same sets. Um, and I, I've got a little um, I've got a little compilation if you're interested just to demonstrate. I'm curious. Yeah, I'd love to see it, Chloe. And mm -hmm. I, but I, I, I maybe I'm going to make a call here. <laughs> Let's see if I I hit it because I mean you had mentioned <laughs> to me the the but when you invited me on that it, Matrix and Dark City these these deserve to be juxtaposed. And I mean right away, even having not seen Dark City and in in years and years, I was like, oh, duh, of course, you know, late <laughs> late nineties, you know, kind of uh, gothic noir, like oh, there's this, you know they're both kind of grappling with um, kind of Gnostic themes. Mm. But within the first 10 minutes of this film, my jaw hit the floor because it's literally a shot for shot um, retake of the first five minutes of the matrix. Like, like oh um, Keith Kiefer Sutherland is, is on the phone and it's exactly like Morgan Freeman in the matrix when he's talking to Neo trying to like, get him to navigate out the building police are are coming in it's basically like when the agents are coming only this time it's the strangers it, it was i i didn't and i i, I I'm, I'm it was uncanny that's all i'll i'll say so oh, oh that's oh. what you've prepped for us but what i really love is the uh is that the end of the movie basically is also the end of the third matrix but <laughs> <laughs> totally, totally. Yeah, I mean, okay, if you I'm I'm so with you and it's just I it's the same idea, but it's just like, oh my gosh, a mature, more considered, more realistic, maybe slightly pessimistic approach to the same topic makes such a difference. But I'll just show you the visuals here. It's only 30 seconds. I thought you might enjoy them, like literally the same sets. And the other one that you possibly noticed uh, was the hotel. I knew. I, okay. Yep. Yep. <laughs> I was when I was watching mm. this. I was like, I've seen those stairs before. Yeah, swimming pool was the weirdest one. I thought, to be honest, it always stood out to me. Um, but never mind. Yeah. So um, maybe we can. I'm glad I'm not alone in it. Yes, I mean, I would be curious about the production cycle, but it it does strike me that it's how do you how do you get films that close to each other when they're produced quite close? I mean, you would think you can't really adjust your film that much in that short space of time, but the 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 parallels in it are quite amazing. It it. I, I do wonder maybe if someone was on set just taking a few notes and just saying, hey, this looked good. Maybe you maybe you want to do that. Maybe a production assistant. I don't know. It's just it's uncanny how close they are. I mean, it goes and it goes beyond. That, that was a great. Um, thanks for taking the time to, to set up that that montage, Chloe. But it, it even goes beyond the, the visuals. I mean, literally, mm -hmm. you, you, you have a scene where Kiefer Sutherland, who sort of plays the the mad scientist, Morpheus, and Morpheus analog mm. character in Dark City, literally calls um, calls the hero and is like, "There's no time. You must listen yeah. to me. I am going to get you out of there, but you need to do exactly what I'm about to tell you to do." And I mean, it's that down to the ring of the telephone. It's the same sound mm. effect. It's uh, it's it's really it, I, it kind of blew my mind that there wasn't any sort of like litigation about this that I would read about. I really want to look if there was now, actually. I, I didn't actually look, but I'm curious. It was well, made by that... the same studio, so maybe they um, wouldn't want a, a, a big sort of litigation battle. You said The Matrix was the year later, right? Yeah. It, it was the following movie? Okay. So they're being produced side by side, presumably with a tiny bit of overlap, but it just it baffles me how they can be this close. Um, but there's a... So there's something right at the start of the film, which I think gives a really key difference between The Matrix and Dark City. Um, and I clipped it together because I think it kind of illustrates it really well. Um, but of course, I cannot find it. There we go. 
So it's one of the first things we see is um, when John Murdoch wakes up, he knocks over a fish in a bowl, then he rescues the fish and puts it in the bathtub. We see uh, the doctor, Dr. Schreiber, played by uh, Kiefer Sutherland. He's got the, the rats in the cage, but he takes them out of the cage and then puts them back into a, a, a larger container. And I'm going to do a massive reach here, but I think this is really important to the difference between Dark City and The Matrix. It's this idea that actually there's no kind of grand heroic, get yourself free from the oppressors and then everyone is free. It's actually, uh, you, you move from one set of constraints to a new set of constraints. Like it's more, it's freer, it's easier to work with, it is more stimulating, it's, it's better, but it's more nuanced than just saying, hey, everyone's free now. Yeah, it's it's definitely like you were saying a more mature and complex and maybe more cynical take mm. on on the storyline. I maybe this is just my sense, I could be wrong here, but for me, while these are very similar movies in theme and I'm sure that that's not a total mistake, I see them as very different movies for this reason even though like you said shot for <laughs> shot there like there there's obviously a lot of overlap. I see the Matrix movie as a as a action movie with a clever plot device mm -hmm. that never really takes the time to go deeply or very thoughtfully into where that plot device would go, which is why when it spent more time on those like the ideology in the in the in the uh, second and third films, they got worse mm -hmm. because it got away from the, what was actually good about the Matrix as where Dark City is much more of a slow burn that is far more focused on the theme. Mm -hmm. So while I think they, they both explore similar things, I think what makes The Matrix a really good movie has very little to do with the actual ideology it explores, as where Dark City that and the visuals pretty much are what make it the movie it is, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. I, oh, I, absolutely. Sorry, LT, go ahead. I think another interesting point that I was I was kind of mulling over yesterday is uh, the differences between um, the strangers in, in Dark City. That's the name of the aliens that are mm -hmm. the, the, basically the architects of the maze, um, the overlords and the, the agents within within the Matrix. And I guess sort of th considering their motives as well as just cons the first thing I noticed was their names, because in in. In the Matrix, you have a, you know, Agent Smith, right? Which is just kind of mm -hmm. this common generic last name. But all of the last names, that some of the different uh, strangers have different names, but they have these names like Mr. Book, Mr. Mm -hmm. Hand, Mr. Sleep. And the point is that they're, all, they're, they're trying to ser search for the human soul or, or try and figure out what it is about human nature. There's there's some aspect to us that would allow them to survive and they just can't seem to grasp it and they can't seem to perceive it. And maybe this is just kind of a superficial point, but I, I thought it was kind of interesting that like they, they're just naming, like most last names kind of derive from some sort of ancient profession, right? Like Smith, mm -hmm. you're, if you're a Smith at some point, an ancestor of yours was, was a Smithy. If you're a gardener, you gardened. Um, there's something to like. There, it was a verb. <laughs> it, was, it was. It had. It, your last name defined what what you did within time, uh, time and 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 space. And I think it was a very interesting decision to give all of the strangers these names that are just sort of static objects. You know, they're just nouns. Like like they can't quite get. Like there's no. There's no Mr. Carpenter in <laughs> within the strangers. They're always just sort of these flat, un uh, immovable objects that they take their, their names from or, or, or ideas. It's never something that um, would be derived from a human vocation. Um, mm -hmm. But I also think it's it's significant that they are trying to kind of tease something out of humanity Whereas in the Matrix, it's much more, I guess, just sort of cut and dry, like um, 
uh, where battery power, right? I don't think there's, mm-hmm. and in, in some way they're not trying to, there's not this, I guess, um, continually scrambling people's memory memories. I think another movie that would be worth talking about maybe for a little while would be Memento. Um, in some Ooh. ways, sort of half, half matrix, half Memento. Um, but the, uh, the fact that there is this kind of motive that's a bit more complex and, and searching uh, with the, the strangers as opposed to yeah, the matrix and the matrix programs like the agents where it seems much more just sort of like where this resource. Um, and I don't know where you're going to be. I'm, I'm very interested to hear where you're going to be going with, um, with elite theory with this Chloe, but the, um, mm-hmm. I, I guess something that occurred to me was sort of this thinking about the, the continual sort of re scrambling and re um, remixing of memories and identities and I guess the sort of I, this this I'm not I don't mean this to sound flippant, but sort of mass immigration and the 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 way that people and human beings are kind of viewed as interchangeable and and moved around on a global chessboard by today's elites mm-hmm. as a way of not I think I mean if you're a cynic you're just saying you know you're you're moving people into a country because you can elites you know international. It, international elites uh do this um because they you know you can pay somebody a lower wage but i do think there is something more to that type of ideology that might be uh, might be more akin to uh, we're trying to find something fundamental about human nature but the only way we can do that is by this this process of of deracination mm-hmm. and um scrambling of of any kind of historical identity. Um, you know, you have to erase those kind of heritable traits or um, cultural, um, historical rootedness in order to get to some sort of human nature. And I, I think obviously people on our side of things consider that to be very misguided. And um, I think that's that's shown here pretty, um, pretty, pretty vividly as well in, in Dark City. I, I am so glad you said that. You you are the right people for this stream. Yeah, I mean, there's well, there's so much we could touch on. Uh, let, let's work with that last element. I think, let's say one of the real strengths for me of the strangers over the agents is it feels like they have a much more coherent, believable, realistic philosophy. And I realize I'm saying this about leather clad things with squids in their brains. This idea of the the managing class would just leave you alone as long as they could, um, you know, use you as a battery. I don't believe that. I, I love that this idea of the managing class, uh, managerial, if you will, would be constantly interfering every night and moving things around. Uh, they Their power is called tuning, like fine tuning. Like they just, they've nearly perfected you. Like, I, I love that. And it's this philosophy of them that humans are just interchangeable, deracinated. Uh, You can just have them be a lord one night and a peasant the next. And that is contrasted with the idea of John Murdoch, who is resisting them because he deep deep down knows who he is. Um, He's not interchangeable. He's actually tied to a place. And that's his basis for starting to resist the imprints as they call it yeah i think it's i think it's really fascinating to pick that piece out of it because yeah it the parallels are are really amazing when you think about the fact that you know they they they're searching for the soul so they're they know they're Mm. missing something like there's something about their existence that is uh that that doesn't quite get them there and the way they're going about it is the most soulless way imaginable, right? Yeah. By just swapping, <laughs> just swapping the data out of humans and assuming that is what's going to, if you just, you know, mix this around enough and run enough iterations of the program, eventually this will explain like what humans are and what they do. And I like the parallel to Memento because that's also one of my favorite movies. And like the soliloquies in that movie, I could go on forever about like how great they are, but. Um, but but the question of what makes you a human, what makes your identity, 
is a very deep one here. Let's also not forget these people aren't people. The squids and the brains are actually the alien and the people mm -hmm. are the dead, right? They say we use your dead. Um, so they're actually animating corpses mm -hmm. uh, in, able to, in, in order to manage these people uh, which and interact with them. Uh, which I think is a really fascinating aspect uh, uh, about kind of how they treat, you know, humans and and why it's so difficult for them to grasp it. And like you said, that that really uh, last things that really then dovetails very well to like how they how they treat all the humans as interchangeable and and the tuning aspect, the small, you know, if we can just nudge them a certain way, if we can just push them a certain way, if we can just manipulate these things the right way, then we'll be able to take this and and this is something i i try to explain to like whenever i i kind of talk to people from the other side of the aisle on podcasts or stuff i'm always explain trying to explain this like you can't just take religion or you can't just take ethnos and just like take the stuff out of it and put it onto a spreadsheet and then apply it to your system and make it work like that those forces are fundamental and they can't be separated from the human and attempts to separate them from the human and mix them around to alter your society is is fundamentally to not understand those forces and what they do and what they provide and that's exactly who these characters are right they 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 are playing with things they do not understand and because they are going about doing it in the most cold clinical dehumanizing way possible uh they, they're doomed to fail in their project and this guy has to has to use his ability uh that he's gained from them to kind of overcome this program so he's he's taking pieces of the managerial guys mm -hmm. here if we want to if we really want to lock this into to to you know elite theory he's taking pieces of these managerial early he's he's taking their tools but he's remembering who he is and what he's tied to and he's turning the tools against these people who who would use them to to keep him and and the rest of his uh you know, his species like deracinated and, and, and asleep. Mm -hmm. I, I might have a slat that that's all very well said, or, I, I might have a slightly darker or more nihilistic and, and cynical take than, mm -hmm. than, than both of you about <laughs> one, one aspect of what you both, both said, because I'll, I'll, I'll admit that this is something that's, that's, left a, a bit open-ended or, or a bit vague but well i mean one thing we don't we didn't touch on in our quick summary is um the john murdoch has there's a woman played by by jennifer conley and we can <laughs> we should also spend another stream just talking about how beautiful a woman this is oh, yes uh, so I, thank you. I, I don't understand how i i'm not somebody that goes off on actresses very very often i don't understand how this woman wasn't cast in in every movie like since labyrinth and mm -hmm. she's just so so stunning and breathtaking but anyway let's talk great, about the rocketeer anyway sorry and <laughs> yeah I mean, this and the rocketeer and then like at, like the house of sand and fog and i, I just mm -hmm. anyway i don't want to get let's put a pin in jennifer conley <laughs> so i don't lose my train of thought but um uh uh, and I didn't. I didn't lose my train of thought. The, um, the, the so that that's John Murdoch's wife, or that's another uh, kind of supporting character within this. Mm -hmm. Where at at least the the way that the memories have certainly been rescrambled, they consider themselves to be man and wife. Although at some point, Jennifer Connelly's character had an affair with another man. Um, and um, but they they have some of the same memories. They both remember having met at Shell Shell Beach. Shell Beach keeps keeps coming up again and again. And there are times in the film when you're led to believe that there there maybe is a, a, a degree of originality or or authenticity to the memory. Maybe this really was a a husband and wife before they were abducted and brought onto into this rat's maze. But ultimately, and I think there's a there's a um, a few minutes with Kiefer Sutherland towards the end of the movie where he's he's basically saying there there's no like there, there's no going back. The the strangers have destroyed the laboratory where all of the sort of original mm -hmm. memories were were ma maintained and there's really no there's no way of ever unwinding this to know if this was ever truly your wife if she ever truly had an affair if um what's what's someone else's memory and what's what is real so my sense is 
at the end of the movie when he does basically he just he he creates Shell Beach out of you know whole cloth using his his psychic powers, and there is there is Jennifer Connelly standing at the end of a pier. But I I don't view that as a return to um to their life before they were um uh, you know abducted and, and manipulated by these aliens. I think ultimately he's I think. He, he comes to terms with the fact that there is no real um, way to ever know fiction from reality or if these mm -hmm. people had any any past together. Um, and what he's doing there really is is starting starting from from square one in search of some sort of um, authentic relationship. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not so much a, a, a restoration. Um, I would say, or or that he's kind of unscrambled anything there. Um, and I think that does kind of, um, I guess, to, the reason why I find that a bit more nihilistic. It's funny, I was, I had a stream with, um, with Joel Davis uh, mm. earlier this week, where we were talking a lot about, um, I, I was talking a lot about sort of American identity and how there is this sort of fundamental postmodern um, condition of being a, a 21st century American. And even though there are a lot of us nowadays that are, are struggling to be sort of postmodern traditionalists, or we see all of the sort of um, missteps of, of the last um, 50 to 75 years of kind of cultural um, deterioration and cultural postmodernism, the idea of kind of returning to any kind of authentic authenticity is um i i find myself skeptical uh of that in a lot of ways that i think this film feels skeptical of that so you know it doesn't really end with them returning to earth it doesn't end with them with with, with giving the audience any kind of certainty um that that that, that the past they've regained a foothold on authenticity. I think what it leaves us with is what whatever they're going to have to build their own authenticity from, from the beginning um, as opposed to reclaiming anything like that. And I think, again, there's just kind of an analogy that, you know, we're, I, I think this may be a particularly an American problem, Chloe, it might not resonate as much with, somebody across the Atlantic, but oh, the no. we're going to kind of achieve <laughs> an, an American identity that we, is going to feel like it hasn't been messed with by elites mm -hmm. is probably too high a bar to set, if that if that makes sense to either of you guys. I, th I think so. I mean, we're, we're going to have very different experiences. You know, you're, you're in the US, I'm in England, but this this did resonate very strongly with me, maybe in a different way, but that idea of, look, you're separated from your past. You've been presented a, a memory of your past, an impression of your past by the authority, but that is sketchy at best. So how do you deal with that? Going forward, yes, how do you connect with it if you're sort of unsure about the authenticity of it and even the authenticity of your connection to it? I. I absolutely uh, felt that that resonated really strongly with me. Um, I, I did want to pick up on one thing, actually, when we're talking about the strangers, because there was a detail that I loved so much in this, just showing how much thought has gone into this. Uh, did you notice their statue? And did it did the statue spark any thoughts? By the statue, Chloe, you're talking about sort of the big head that, that opens up when they're tuning? That's the one. That's the one, the very Metropolis-style uh, head. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, now that you say it, yeah. <laughs> I, well, I, I think this is just set design at its absolute peak. So they're focused around this giant head, this giant skull. And then when they do their business, the skull opens up, and there is a clock inside. And it's a neat visual, but I think it, it's basically their whole philosophy. What's inside man? Well, mechanisms. It's the idea that really we're, we're just a mechanical material thing that can be predicted and messed with. And it 
it's a whole worldview just captured in a statue. And I, I, I thought that was such a neat detail. I, I, yeah, I, I, I'm embarrassed that I didn't, didn't pick up on it. Another, I guess one other detail uh, worth mentioning about the strangers is it just, they, it's Cenobites, right? Or it's Hellraiser without the pins or not, oh, yeah. not, not Hellraiser, sorry. Um, no, you, you're no, right. Hellraiser it. is Cenobites. Oh, good, good. I did get it right. <laughs> but, Nailed um, it. but not, I guess uh, where they're, uh, although they're not sort of, I guess, addicted to hedonism in some way, they're sort of this uh, uh, more kind of ascetic, um, anodyne, you know, mm -hmm. I guess it seems like one of their main problems is that they can't feel, but mm -hmm. aesthetically, I think they're borrowing a lot from, from Hellraiser. Oh, totally, totally. Um, Murgy regularly in the chat has said clockwork ban. Absolutely. Um, I, I think I had the still earlier where they, they have a Vitruvian man pose which um, I, I might butcher this a bit, but the idea of this also, the Vitruvian man gets you to the idea of um, trying to plan man as a bit of an instrument, as a mechanism. I hope, I don't, I don't know my Da Vinci well, so possibly I've just embarrassed myself on there, but it's a subtle detail hinting again that they have this idea of humans as just material mechanisms. Um, but yeah, the Cenobites are in there as well. It, it's echoing that it's that feeling of detachment not getting the human experience i love it um since your your time is possibly a bit limited uh lt shall we move on to a bit of the 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 elite theory of uh of dark city yeah let's do it excellent i i was i was tempted to call this uh the stream the iron law of dark city i might I might sneakily uh, change it afterwards, as I, I thought maybe that I only realized nice. later in the day. It's a good title. It's a good title. Um, so I, I think I probably, if I said I have a cynical view of the film, I probably shouldn't have. There's there's plenty of reasons to, to feel cynical about it. I mean, the revelation about Shell Beach is, you know, very cynical. You've been presented with this paradise that just isn't there. Of course, in the Matrix, it kind of is because you can break out and there is a real escape. Um, this Shell Beach thing here is very um, The Running Man. I'm sure if we've uh, seen that. But, um, possibly yeah, it's not. it's just a long time. It's been a long okay. time. But <laughs> no. I, I say I've seen it, but it's been a very long time. Do, don't worry, don't worry. I, if, we're doing a stream on it soon, so um, it's been on my mind. Um, so for the elite theory, it's... Um, Effectively, John Murdoch has realised that he is effectively a challenger to them, um, to the strangers. And the strangers act very much like I would consider a managerial elite. As I said, I really love that we have this more realistic view that they don't just leave you alone. They have to interfere. They're in there every night messing with you. Um, as, as we said, their power is called tuning, as in fine tuning. And it really represents the, the way that you, you can't escape from power. They do have to meddle. They do have to expand and uh, try and perfect humanity. And there's a really cute hint about that uh, really early on, I think one of the first scenes in the film. It's, it's not very subtle, but this is what's on at the cinema. Um, yes, they do, they do all their um, mischief at midnight and the the evil is a late show every single night. It's a cute little touch that you pick up on the rewatch. Okay, so that that's the idea of the strangers as kind of a managerial elite, uh, very bureaucratic, not really getting you, uh, but interfering. Um, and then the other idea that I really liked is this uh, is Michelle's Iron Law of Oligarchy. So. Put very crudely, uh, in the world of the Matrix, you can overthrow the system broadly um, and end the reign of terror. You know, the, um, the cruel overarching machines can be defeated, they will retreat, and you are free to do whatever. But in Dark City, um, it's, I don't want to say cynical, I want to say it's realistic because John Murdoch at the end, after the 
a wonderful anime psychic battle. Um, he's gone Super Saiyan, he's won, it's all good. He doesn't just drop everything. Uh, he takes charge. What we have isn't just um, the, the evil bad guys defeated. What we have is a cycling of elites. Uh, and once John Murdoch is in charge, having driven out, having driven out the strangers, he then begins to reshape the city in his own way. I, and I read that as the the film basically recognizing that idea that there will be an elite in power. You you just want one who has your interests in in mind. Yeah, I think that uh, really speaks to what Last Things read on the movie, which, you know, is this idea that uh, you don't, they, they don't return to something. It, it now just, and they don't escape them. You know, they're all still stuck in the city. Mm -hmm. They're not on Earth. They don't go home. They don't, you know, they don't find a portal that takes them back or land the ship somewhere. They're simply, and they're not, uh, everyone doesn't wake up and become equal, right? Murdoch mm -hmm. is the only one with this power. Uh, and so he's effectively now the king, right? He shapes the reality around him. So they they haven't thrown off the chains of oppression. They haven't escaped the system. Like you said, they have simply now have someone in control of the power who, in theoretically at least, cares about uh, about the well-being of, of the, the city itself and the people there. I also think it's interesting when you're talking about the circulation of elites, if you want to mm -hmm. read it this way. Like if you want to apply the kind of kind of the understanding of the circulation elites to the events of the movie, one of the reasons that circulations of elites occur in elite theory is that the system gets too sclerotic, right? It can't, it doesn't mm -hmm. allow people who are up and coming, who have the talent, who have the ability to enter into a into the class, right? A, a healthy elite is is uh, making those people. They're integrating them into the structure of the society. Um, but a, an unhealthy one is blocking the ascension of those people and integrating them into the system to keep it healthy and working, and and keeps them stratified, right? And that's what these you know people, uh, the the strangers, want to do initially is is keep him you know destroy him or keep him separate mm -hmm. uh because humans aren't supposed to have this power uh they want to understand the human soul but they don't really want to be tainted by the humanity and then by the end they're actually wanting to first they they give his memories to one of them to make it more capable of of like tracking him and understanding what he's going to be doing. And and they're warned against it by one of their members. Like we can't, mm. we can't do this. We can't let this, you know, uh, enter into our, our consciousness because that'll it'll taint us. And obviously we know that the, the, the one stranger who's injected with it becomes, you know, kind of agent Smith style, like kind of mm -hmm. loses it and, and, and goes rogue because he, he's got all the, he becomes the monster that, uh, that uh, John was meant to be imprinted with. But at the same time, also eventually they try to uh, they try to put their entire consciousness into John and in kind of this last ditch effort to to kind of force the integration. Uh, so mm -hmm. that's kind of an interesting thing is that it, at the end, uh, you know, Kiefer Sutherland switches the vials and and gives him the ability to counter that. But at the end, they kind of come to this realization that they they kind of have to integrate with this new elite if they want to survive. Um, and it's only the kind of the uh, the revenge of the doctor that keeps uh, that plan from going forward. Well, yeah, that absolutely fits. You have, um, as you said, they're, they're unable to keep up with the changing paradigm. It's, it's a tension in elite theory that you do have an elite, but they aren't unmoored. They do have to respond to the populace to some extent. They have to respond to the wider situation in another extent. And we see the strangers clearly losing grasp on technology, on the situation. Uh, even though they nominally have complete control, we see them repeatedly make these errors and get sort of clumsily, say, squished between buildings. Um, and more people clearly fail to take the imprints. So you do get the feeling that they're losing control of the situation, which is uh, the window for another elite to take their place. So I, I, I feel it, it lines up very well. And as you say, the, it, it is very much a last ditch effort to try and integrate 
And at that point, uh, the situation I feel has just gone too far for them. And hence they're, they're what's the phrase? They're cleared out and we get a new start. Hmm. Guys, I'll be I'll be honest. I I didn't I did not hear any anything that anybody said for the last fifteen minutes because I've just been thinking about Jennifer Conley. <laughs> many many such cases. Many such cases. <laughs> no, I'm 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 messing with you guys. But um, but yeah, um, I, and I think it's there in the name the the name too, like the the strangers, right? They could have named mm -hmm. these guys the masters or the puppet masters or, or something like that. But strangers to me really does make it very clear that these are like, these are elites without skin in the game. You know, they're mm. not, they're not tied to the land. They're not people. That's why they can continually kind of scramble people's um, uh, memories or, or, or traits or what have mm. you, because they themselves, I mean, I think part of the, the reason why they're studying humanity is that they, they can't reproduce. Um, so they don't really have any sort of empathy or sympathy or understanding for a kind of continuum, whether that's a continuum of, of personality or the continuum of a relationship or a family. And it also kind of funny enough puts me in mind of like um, sort of the <laughs> the, fa the failing birth rates amongst a lot of <laughs> like, you know, if you are this type of elite, if you are sort of a, you know, like cadaverous, ossifying um technocrat you probably have one anemic child in your 40s and you need to figure out what it is about um the masses that allow them to actually like flourish and reproduce <laughs> that's probably that's probably an extreme stretch and it, it has more to do with the fact that i've been listening to too much ed dutton before i rewatch the movie <laughs> but it did occur to me i was like yeah they're like they they, they can't actually figure out that um you know, uh, the the fecundity uh, has something to do with actually having having sort of shared interests. Um, and I, I would love to build on that with, yeah, I think we can take another reach. Um, I A big aspect from this is like, there's a vitality to John Murdoch that they just don't get. Like he's awoken by memories. He's awoken by passions and connection and love and they just do not have that and that that's that's what's defeating them you know that this very rationalistic detached worldview is is btfo'd by a sort of vital sense of self um jennifer connelly um and i i think more connelly posting needs to happen when we first see her and i think we should see her again it's been a few minutes let's let's get her up again she is singing a beautiful song i, I have so several tabs <laughs> several connolly tabs lovely um you roboted a bit there lt um hopefully it fixes um the song she's singing and i know i'm reading into everything she's singing the song sway which is effectively um it's a song about being taken over by an impulse you can't really understand, but it's deep in you. Like she hears, she hears a rumba rhythm, and she starts to sway. You're like that has a sort of control over her, but it's a lot more vital and natural and healthy. And I'm possibly reading way too much into every detail in this movie, but I I see it all in there. If I could also read into a detail of this movie, I think what's interesting also is that Murdoch is awakened by what he's not, right? Mm -hmm. uh, he he's deeply passionate ab about the about the love, but he's also very disturbed by the idea that he would be a killer and he needs to test himself to know if this is who he is, right? He immediately puts mm -hmm. himself in a situation where he's in the room with another sex worker and needs to test himself and figure out if this is really who he is and, and, and how he's defined. And so I don't, they don't say this explicitly, but I like to think that part of what wakes him up is how much he rejects that imprint, right? It is, this is not me. This is, you cannot make me this person. This is not who I, who I want to become. And interestingly, when the, they inject the same memories into a stranger, he who should be above these things right should be 
this different mm -hmm. species that doesn't have these emotions, doesn't feel these things, he becomes exactly that person. He come, becomes exactly that serial killer mm -hmm. monster, right? So Murdoch is able to reject the memories that are supposed to transform him into this monster because he's human. And the unhuman, the inhuman kind of dead thing it becomes the monster he's supposed to be. Mm. Yeah, there, there's something powerful in the fact that um, the elites in, control, in cultural control try to uh, try to imprint on, on him an identity of evil, tell him to tell him he was really evil and corrupt and bad, and that's really what allowed him to sort of wake up and start rejecting that message. Yeah, and, and I don't know if there are any parallels. Uh, but not only not only just wake up, but maybe that that's in some way what births the the ability to tune within him you know he mm -hmm. he realizes that his whole environment is so air sats that 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 is what gives him the ability to to kind of architect that his his reality because he just realizes the the, the inauthenticity of everything um mm -hmm. i've got another weird this is like another total stretch but maybe it's worth talking about um Kiefer sutherland's character for a few minutes as sort of a, um, mm. I guess, kind of like a rogue intellectual, right? I, oh. I, I like, I, I think he reminded me of AA, like academic agent. <laughs> I want, I want, I want a, I think AA needs to replace his all about Eve avatar with um, Kiefer Sutherland from Dark City. But, you know, there's, he's sort of, you know, kept on by these uh, strangers who kind of feel like they, they need him but you know that his tenure is sort of like uh, maybe in jeopardy, and I mean there really is that these kind of moments where he's attempt. There's at least two moments in the movie where he's really just attempting to red pill Murdoch, um, <laughs> you know, like in the in the beginning when he calls him, and I guess every scene that they have together, it's him attempting to, you know, persuade him about what's happening until finally he hands him the uh, the syringe that will eventually sort of give him full clarity uh, and um, he'll be able to see everything transparently and he'll be able to uh, have the, the kind of strength and capacity to fight the, the strangers. Um, but yeah, I do think, I, I mean, I think probably the most interesting character uh, in, uh, in, in some sense, the only character because he's somebody that that does, even though he had to erase his his past, he does have a a personality that is consistent throughout the movie. He's the only one that's not searching for his own continuity um, and can kind of see the totality of the plot. He's the he narrates the um the opening lines that kind of spoil the the movie. Um but but he is somebody that sort of he he's the only character that has the elite theory within the movie, and he's just trying to communicate it to the people that are are suffering under it. Yeah, he's he's definitely aware of it. I I like the idea of him sort of red pilling and the sequence where he's just inserted himself into uh, Murdoch's memories was just an absolute treat. I I loved how they did that. Yeah, so um, that idea of a and again, intellectual... sorry, sorry, Chloe, oh, but that, that's like that was that was a better version of Morpheus training Neo in Kung Fu, right? Oh, Another yes. Matrix parallel. Yes, absolutely, and a similar thing of um, just realizing that the system's rules only apply when you want them to. It's it's excellent. Um, this image right here would be the perfect academic agent thumbnail. Like I'm going to have to shoot it, ring. aren't I? I think yeah. I can shoot this for him. Okay. Yeah. Challenge accepted. I mean, the the last shooping project I did was one of the uh, John D biographies. So mm. um, this will be a much more wholesome in comparison. Um, in terms of like a rogue intellectual, I, I, I could be off here. My understanding is... In elite theory, the idea is that the intellectual class is effectively the post, they provide the post hoc rationalization for the regime. And he does sort of do this uh, in the film, sort of. He's got his. Um... Well, actually, I'm not sure if he does ever justify them. He, he justifies his actions with them, doesn't he? 
But then he does help with the overthrowing. He 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 says that he's a traitor to his people. Mm. Yeah, at the beginning, he describes himself as a traitor to his people because he's uh, because he's working with the. Um, but I'm trying to remember if they they explain why. I don't. It doesn't immediately jump to mind as to why he has agreed to work for them. I think it's because he knows what he's lost. Yeah. He again, he has a con- even if his memories are gone, he knows that he had memories that were taken. And he knows that he's been robbed of his roots, and he's he's bitter about that. Again, it's it's that idea of um. This is a deep, deeply intrinsic thing, and you cannot just ignore it because it doesn't fit into a rational schema. Mm. You know this this would not be a thing that they planned for. They figure take take the dude's memories. And we can use his skills and it will be fine. But they're trying to be rational about human beings who are not rational. You know, we, we are in both the strangers regime and the Murdoch regime, you know, humans are constrained, but it's whether we're constrained by this alien vision or whether we're constrained by our own natural constraints, our our own ethnos, our own basis, our own background and memories i think too that that um keith or sutherland's character is sort of you know i, I guess biding his time and and knowing when and how to, to strive i guess he's in a mold buggy and practicing path until there is a you know he does not want a a victory and that until there is somebody that a man who rises from the people who is oh. cap- it's LT. Like- sorry, you're roboting. You're roboting. Can you um? Can you just take a shot again? I think I think I got what you're going at. But do you want to just take a shot again? Oh sure, sure. Sorry, uh, man. You're good now. I was I was I I think that um, Berlin's character is in a way just biding his time and um, kind of I was put in mind of. Uh, Curtis Yu's advice of being passivity, avoiding Pyrrhic victories. And until there is sort of, we sort of do have a, a Caesar figure in Murdoch, a man who's finally kind of risen from the, the masses who's capable of, um, uh, you know, overthrowing the elites. And, mm-hmm. and once he sees that there's somebody that is capable of tuning, that's capable of meeting the elites, um, you know, on their own, <laughs> on their own battleground, that that's when he, he strikes. So mm-hmm. I, I think there's, he's, he's sort of, I mean, yes, I guess he did betray people, but he's also just shrewd. He's not going to, you know, he's not going to step out from behind his Anon account until it's going to, it matters for something, you know? Mm. I like that. Yeah. He, he, we see people do some Peric victories. We see people, um, well, maybe let's contrast Dr. Schreiber with uh, one of the detectives who was first on this case. And I'm afraid I've lost the chap's name, um, but before- Played by uh, William Hurt, right? I think oh no, the, the guy before- The William one that goes Hurt, crazy. That's oh. the guy, yeah. Yeah, the, the one that goes crazy is, is kind of your guy who can't adapt to the situation, who maybe want, thinks it can be solved instantly. And I think to an extent maybe thought that it could be solved within the rules, within the system. And that not happening, I think, just breaks him until he um, effectively, he doesn't waste himself trying to, say, pyrrhically uh, go for a pyrrhic victory, attempting to attack the strangers. He just, you know, self-terms in a fairly memorable fashion. Um, Chloe, think, uh, it just it just occurred to me too, I don't, I don't know why I didn't remember the doctor's name, but it's Doctor Doctor Schrieber is mm. Sutherland's character. So I mean, that's the that's German for writer, uh, and I think it's also interesting that his name is it's like scribe or writer, mm. and you have the um, the 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 sort of chief of the strangers is named Mister Book, right? Ooh. Which is sort of a I guess again like a sort of static object. It's been written. And then you, I mean, I don't know, Schreiber to me, that that again kind of 
he's our narrator in the movie, certainly, but he also, as an intellectual, is somebody who is kind of mapping the territory, articulating mm -hmm. all of the kind of um, powers at work here, what will and will not work. Yeah, um, I mean, the, the parallel is, is incredibly neat. Uh, he's also based off a real doctor, but it's like you've got the two for one there. I, I love that connection between uh, Schreiber, uh, the writer, and uh, Book. Yeah, that's great. Um, but yeah, he, he was based on a uh, real life uh, doctor who was a contemporary of Freud and Jung, uh, who is a schizophrenic. Um, so some of the research that um, Alex Proyas did into this is quite interesting. Well, sorry, I don't know if it was definitely the director, Alex Proyas. Um, when this film went into big production, they got two additional writers on, uh, David Goyas and uh, Lem Dobbs, um, who have a slightly different background to uh, Price. We should note, actually, um, Proyas is very international. He's got Greek parents. He was born in Egypt, and then he was raised in Australia. And so in terms of that sort of slight feeling of rootlessness, of being a little bit disconnected from your surroundings, I, I do wonder if... Um, if his upbringing maybe helped him connect to that a bit. Um. Interesting. Yeah, maybe yeah. so. Mm. I also like that um, he, there's, I've read a few interviews with him where people are just throwing at him sort of what you'd expect, the idea that uh, for Dark City, I think you're, you're really channeling Plato's allegory of the cave. And he, in these interviews, he, he seems to do the sort of classic director's sort of, yeah, whatever, shrug. You know, they, they do this a lot when someone makes a suggestion that they're not really keen on, but they don't really want to say, no, that's daft. No, go away. They say, oh, yeah, yeah, I can, uh, maybe, maybe that fed into it a little bit. Or, oh, I, I didn't actively plan that, but maybe, maybe I was kind of influenced by that. Yeah, sure. And it, he did that for a few readings, but. Hmm. I, I think it's it's so much more interesting than the sort of um, Plato's cave an, uh, analogy, which obviously the Matrix uh, makes it sort of bread and butter when it attempts something. The um, I, you know, one of the other just a, one other I guess aside about Sutherland, I think one of the few things people remember about the movie is is his performance and the mm -hmm. sort of strange speech pattern. I wonder if that's something that was really attributed to. The, the the actual person the character is based on because it's very strange. I don't know if it's something Sutherland thought of on his own or if he 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 had coaching to kind of ape that weird kind of staccato in breaths and uh, yeah, I think it's something that sticks with everybody about the movie. He also loses it in the dream sequence. He also loses it when he when they inject the memories. He doesn't oh, yeah. keep that pattern anymore. Huh. Oh. I did not notice that. My goodness. I, mean, I, I noticed. Other... Oh, sorry. Go ahead, LT. No, no. Sorry, Chloe. You go. You go first. I was just going to say on on accents. I noticed that the um, the strangers deliberately do not have the accent of everyone else. Like they have this quite implacable blend. I think Ian Richardson lets the English out a bit too much, but uh, Mr. Hand is uh, played by Richard O'Brien is really trying to have a quite odd blend of accents so you just can't place it it's not tied to anywhere i really love that as a touch and um, with uh, dr schraber here though one i i'm not intending this to I, I worry this will sound bad and it's not intended um to be an insult or, or snide or anything uh, i i got sort of forest whitaker vibes from the performance um, huh. <laughs> slightly aided by the eye prosthetic Mm. I, I'm again I'm not intending that as a dig I just it's a similar verbal style and a similar um uh, I get it no I get idiosyncrasy it. you know I I couldn't get away from that image and I just wondered was was Southern deliberately going for that the the one actor we have I, I, that's a that's an amazing observation Chloe no I, I completely see it the one actor we haven't taught mentioned is the and I don't know that I don't know this guy, but I will say he's very interesting looking. The man that plays John Murdoch, 
And has he been in my, my wife and I were watching it last night and we both commented like, has this guy been in, in anything else? Cause he's very oh, yeah. striking looking. No, he's he a fascinating he's, face, but I, I don't recall him from other movies. He's the Alper Grutten Fuhrer from um, man of the high castle. Oh, okay. Well that oh, would, I goodness. haven't, I've not seen that. So yeah, he no. is. Yes. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> he actually is. Yeah, that's no, he, amazing. Yeah, he does an amazing job in that show. Um, and I, I don't know if he's one of these people that fell off because I feel like he was like a, a like a kind of a leading man fighting for kind of positions around that time, and then he just didn't take off. And then mm -hmm. you know he started coming back in like TV shows and things. I, I that's the vibe I got. I, I didn't like scour his imdb but i feel like that's the case he probably got shot down by jennifer conley and it so affected his self-confidence <laughs> that would like be very devastating yeah, that he yeah. just like would stop going to auditions right why why even get out of bed in the morning at that point? he just stayed home and watched rocket man yeah over and over again the that rocketeer nice sir the rocket <laughs> rocket rocket <laughs> It is a film of my childhood, and you will give it the respect it deserves. Yeah, look, um, LT, I was happy to let it go when you called Lawrence Fishburne Morgan Freeman. Yeah, he sure but, did. But you will not besmirch the uh, career of Jennifer Connolly. Uh, not in this house, sir. You know, I think between The Rocketeer and the Batman TV show cartoon, I think that's what, like, my brain is now, like, hardwired to love Art Deco. And like that, but like I aesthetically cannot escape that. Um, mm. But anyway, sorry, that's yeah. an aside. You're absolutely fine. I, th I think Sewell's always been, I, I can see that interpretation. I think he's been a bit more of a, a theatrical guy, but he, he, he does have a fair few um, roles that, that I'm now just thinking, oh gosh, yeah, that, that was him. I hadn't really placed it. Maybe um, so, Jennifer Conley made a deal with the devil where she only is allowed to be in movies that have some sort of art deco set design. Aesthetic. Yes. Well, that's how you keep from aging. Like the, mm -hmm. like you, you right. never age, but you're only allowed to emerge for, yeah. And noir yeah. films with an art deco. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, the lighting works for her. What can I say? It's, mm -hmm. um, I mean, if I ever needed a reason to rewatch, absolute pleasure <laughs> um was there anything else we wanted to say uh, oh wait we, we didn't really talk about william hurt much um i mean we, we've gone on to um rufus sewell a bit who yeah has a, a a very good screen presence a a very um just very captivating sort of haunted look um i wanted to point out one thing that i thought was interesting it's completely unrelated to the film. But the start where he wakes up naked in a bathtub and then there's a dead body with spirals drawn all over it. I'm thinking this might mean nothing to you too, but there is, I, I just thought maybe 1998, the creators of Saw were seeing this and thinking, oh, I've got to put that one in the bank. Like it's it's kind of uncanny, with this sort of dark green lighting, those elements. It it parallels Saw very well, and I I wonder if there's a little bit of an homage there, a little unintended influence. I definitely noticed the the spiral, but I certainly didn't put together with the lighting, so that's interesting. Uh, oh, I've got this theory that Saw is just the result of one long movie marathon where they watched. <laughs> sorry, that is my cat. Hello, Gatsby. Um, yeah, I just feel like they binged Dark City, Cube, and Seven. And somewhere in their dreams that night, all those three movies coalesced and we got sore. But that's that's my own little fan theory. Yeah, there's also, um, so around, around the, the late 90s, um, there's actually a, a documentary about this. There, I don't know if either of you are familiar with the... Um, white wolf games they're that they were a, a rpg mm. company that made i mean their big their biggest title what was and is vampire the masquerade but they had a whole lot of um uh games that that took place within within the world of darkness and there's a um a documentary out just about how they um 
they sort of gave birth to the the gothic punk aesthetic in a lot of ways. And in fact, the, un, the speaking of, I, I mentioned earlier, sort of litigation, they wound up suing and I think winning against the um, underworld movies about the like the vampires and the lycans. And uh, those are um, <laughs> those are very, very flagrant kind of rip off. <laughs> but there's a lot of I mean, they definitely influence the the. Um, the matrix they did a lot of there's a um uh an artist named kevin bradstreet that they worked with a great deal who was sort of the the godfather of a lot of gothic punk anyway but that circle that that spiral is uh something that's very iconic in a lot of their um their their imagery and their games um so i, I and i would say i would put dark city kind of right in that that it fits right in that time frame and right in that um it would be amongst the films that I would list as people that were definitely, even if indirectly getting a lot of um, cultural influence from, uh, from white wolf. You think the, uh, the writers sat down to play too many games of Hunter or werewolf. They didn't. Know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I will Jack, be. Yeah. Jack Chick told me this would happen. You know, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can't mess with that. The pipeline. Let's let's be honest. Jack Chick was right a lot about a lot more than people wanted. To can I? Can I? I'll, I'm gonna. I'm adding gonna, a thousand almost actually. But anyway, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna confess. I'm gonna confess something to you both now, and this is gonna. This will de destroy any opportunity I have forever. Uh, a date, dating Jennifer Conley. Um, <laughs> More so, you were so the, close. The wife and the wife and kids. So I was a teen. They I was would about, understand. I was I was seventeen when this movie came out, and I was I was involved in a um, uh, World of Darkness LARP at a local uh, a local city, like a, a live action role play, and I I based my vampire off of Kiefer Sutherland's character in this movie. So. That is some uh, deep I, I, lore. I My practiced. I, I I practiced his like his voice pattern and like uh, other people that were in the LARP were like, "Are you doing the Dark City guy?" And uh, I can, yeah, I could just it's weird. My wife is screaming in the background, like you're supposed to not share that. My, <laughs> <laughs> Go to your weird. grave with that information. I just lost like 300 subscribers. So <laughs> <happens. So> weird. <laughs> I hear my wife screaming. Do you guys hear that? That's not my cat. That's my wife's uh, uh, libido um, dying. So, oh no! Yeah, that's my that's that, that's the most embarrassing thing I've confessed to on my channel. But I, <laughs> I, it, it's it, it's 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 relevant. So, somewhere in the closet, that leather trench coat is in there. The old cane, ready to dust it off for spec. That's a five thousand sub special. You're gonna bust that out and do the whole stream in character. Maybe, maybe I have it on every time I stream. You guys don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nifty, nifty. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm so glad we got to do this because I just find, I find this is so overlooked, but the people who see it just love this movie. Um, the director has actually started a bit of a project. Um, there is a, he's trying to do more in the Dark City world. And I only just found out about this, but there's um, more developments that happened at the end of last year. Um, I'm just trying to look at, okay, got it. Um, yeah, so the director made a short film called Mask of the Evil Apparition. Catchy. Um, and he wrote and directed it. It's set in the Dark City universe. I'm not sure I like just saying it's set in the Dark City cinematic universe set. Yeah, it's, I don't want any of this, with me. to be clear. I do yeah. not want any It sounds of too much like Marvel Cinematic Universe. Uh, yeah. yeah. It gives me the creeps. Yeah, he was, um, yeah, so Proyas revealed uh, in uh, 2021 and when this short film was released that he's in the early stages of developing a Dark City series and I can only beg that he doesn't, you know. Yeah. No, it's like, let, let me just like, creative people i'm not one of you mm -hmm. and i appreciate what you do but for the love of all that is good and holy just make something let it be that thing mm -hmm. and then just leave it alone like you it doesn't have to be a 10 movie thing it doesn't have to be an extended series just let it be beautiful and be mm -hmm. like an hour and a half and say what it has to say and then 
do something else. Like, and yes. any any dark city that is being greenlit and and uh, permitted to come into existence by t- our today's strangers mm. is going to have the strangers will be the heroes and they will be <laughs> <That's> <laughs> right. battling white supremacy by like I don't know like you know put making people go to bed every night at midnight and swapping our our memories it'll has, be really has has rearranged the world to create better covid compliance you know? i i, I call you know, absolute bslt are you telling me netflix is going to make a series where the pasty old white guys are the heroes no chance well the, the yeah. strangers will oh exactly they'll diversify like they the do. strangers yeah. they'll diversify the strangers i i yeah. think it'll be a very diverse ragtag group of uh misfits that overcome the strangers i think <laughs> Uh, well you know it'll keep it, chloe it'll keep you and me in videos for years so we should actually pray for the its arrival i've changed my mind like make it as crap as possible do it guys do it <laughs> yeah um i i do feel like anything that happens now is going to take the there's a reading of this that is like very general audience friendly that obviously we have not touched on or gone near Ugh. any other channel can cover that stuff but it's this idea that dark city is about the you know the mighty individual the power of individualism over the collective you know you just got to be true to yourself you know and it's like oh that's that's the most basic acceptable standard uninteresting reading of the film it's like it's Oh, it's so deep, so much deeper than that. Oh. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would agree. I mean, the only other th- th- I th- thing that I had in, in my in my notes to to mention was that there is. I one other thing, th- kind of quick observation is when the um, strangers come out at night after the tuning to sort of this is when everybody's been reset, their memories have been resorted. Mm-hmm. Um, you see, you have a lot of scenes of the strangers kind of positioning people uh, in chairs mm-hmm. or like, you know, applying makeup or, or I guess doing the kind of final touches. And it, it I think it's a, a very deliberate kind of nod to movie making. Like it looks like they're, they're, mm-hmm. uh, they're you know, costume designers or they're, they're prepping an actor or an actress uh, or a news anchor before going on camera. It really does just like they're setting a stage, you know, they'll move people's hands. Um, and I think that's that, that's kind of a meta uh, <laughs> meta nod to the, the, the act of, of movie making and uh, and narrative control. Oh, I like that. I like that. I mean, there's so much in here like you can just we've all picked up on very different things in it. It's, it's just a rich film, I think, possibly because it was in development meant so long that it's not a rushed script they had the time to really fill it with ideas and make it so complex but also it does have a, a nice very how can i say um mainstream acceptable reading that a lot of people would would just snap up and and say oh this is this is nice and generic and it, it helps the um more interesting elite theory friendly elements slip under the radar there definitely <laughs> well um if the if you had anything else to say we could go for that otherwise uh shall we draw the stream to a close yep sounds good sounds great let's let's do this again soon this was a lot of fun oh fantastic fantastic well um I, I, when the uh, appropriate movie comes up, I will send it your way. Uh, if there is something you're particularly interested in, I get a feeling the Rocketeer might be popular. Then um, just just <laughs> hit me up in the chat. We can do it. You know. Um, but I'll reiterate my thanks. I hope uh, everyone has enjoyed the stream. I see it's a, been a good chat tonight. Uh, we have one final film that we are covering in the '90s sci-fi horror arc. A very different film, but I think probably the most requested film that i've had it is event horizon um yeah yeah oh yeah whole lot of requests for that and I, i'm really chuffed that we're going to be doing that so that is tuesday that is tuesday at 8 p.m as we always do so be there for that make sure you do your horror homework um but it's really nice to do this sort of 
stream with a very different vibe. So thank you both so much for coming on. Awesome. Thanks again. No worries. Is there pleasure. anything you'd like to shill before you go? Uh, before we uh, round things off? <laughs> nah. <laughs> <laughs> he's above the shill he has no need i i've had to restrain myself from doing the whole smash like guys smash like while you're here i would never dream of sullying the stream by saying smash like subscribe share to your friends um <laughs> because we're above that it's a more dignified stream i i will shill your chat with joel davies and uh, i will also reiterate uh thanks for uh being something of a script consultant on one of the upcoming projects. It's much appreciated last things. Oh, my, my pleasure. I'm sure I'm going to, I'm going to need some input sooner or later as well. <laughs> Absolutely. Pleasure. All right. Uh, and Aaron, if, if you, you know, you, you're Phil Collins, you don't, you don't need to shill on this channel. You're okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. as always, it's a great time. I really appreciate you inviting these things. It's always great to like mix it up. You know, I always have to talk about, you know, the politics. And so this is, this is a lot of fun. Oh, I'm really glad you enjoyed it. All right. Well, um, I will I will sign off now. I'll just say if you um if you haven't seen it yet, I put out a video last week which I'm super proud of. It is a bit of an epic on uh pro and anti abortion messages in horror movies and how those messages are coded and hidden completely differently. It's it's an unusual one, but I've had great responses. So if you're looking for something else to watch, uh, then give that give that a go. That's called. Oh, I've complete. Uh, you'll find it on my channel. It, it's pretty unmissable. It's the last video I put out. Uh, I'm going to leave it off there. I'll reiterate thanks to my guests, thanks to the chat, and we'll call it a night. Thanks, y'all. <laughs>